Okay. I, I, I believe we're live. It says we're live, so I'm guessing we are. Okay. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so, so hey, hey everyone. Uh, okay. Welcome. Uh, this session. It says we're live, so I'm guessing we are. Okay. Uh, Yay. Oh, look, I've got, I've got an echo. So, oh, let me turn that so, off there. Okay. All right. So uh, today we've got uh, Benny Muscala. I hope I pronounced that sort of correctly. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Okay, uh, so my name's Keto, and I'm going to be your moderator. Uh, and Benny is going to tell us all about uh, querying your code base with CodeQL. So, uh, with that, take it away, Benny. All right, thanks for the intro. Um, just like in order to give you like today, we want to go like into a deep dive into CodeQL, and at the same time, I want to like give you an overview of what's going on uh, at GitHub, using GitHub, and how to use CodeQL on top of GitHub. So. Uh, let's get started here. Uh, the whole story begins like three years ago now in 2019 when GitHub launched the Security Lab, which is like a lab inside GitHub that helps and helps the communities to secure the world software. And the idea is that we at GitHub, we help other people. Like we don't do it alone, but we need like the whole community to do it together. So the whole idea is we try to provide as many things as possible for the community to secure the whole ecosystem. And today I'm going to talk about a few things that we do there and especially uh, CodeQL, which can be used um, to find security vulnerabilities as well and query a code base using it. So the context of this talk is that we are going to attack it from like a security vulnerability angle. So we are going to look for security vulnerabilities in the code base. We try to learn how we use CodeQL. And me, I'm working at GitHub um, as a senior software engineer. I'm working on the CodeQL tooling. So this is the, these are the tools that, for example, the security lab is using to, um, to find those vulnerabilities. And if we take a step back, uh, we have four large pillars at GitHub, uh, how we treat uh, security in the ecosystem. And the first, the first one is the secret scanning approach. So the secret scanning feature at GitHub is all about you have some commit, you, for example, introduced an API key in your, in your commit accidentally, like you left it in there in some credentials files, or you accidentally hard coded some, some secrets into your, into your code, you pushed it to GitHub and it's actually leaking out there. And so the, the whole, the whole point of, um, GitHub detecting it is to actually avoid that those secrets are leaked, so it, it tries to it tries to uh, stop your push uh, your your pushes to um, stop those those credentials to leak. And if they're actually leaked already on a branch, for example, uh, it helps you to invalidate those keys so nobody else can use them. A second large pillar of what we do at GitHub for um, code security are the security advisories, um, CVEs and CWEs. Uh, so we have the CVE database uh, on GitHub where people can actually lock their, like their vulnerabilities when they have found something in, in a library, uh, they can specify the affected version, they can specify in which version is, um, is fixed or where those, those vulnerabilities are fixed. Uh, you get the CVE IDs. So this all helps together to, to see like which things are open, what will, what will happen if, if those are uh, like if, if you use those dependencies and how your, your code base is also affected by, for example, vulnerable dependencies. And so that actually brings us to supply chain security, which is one other large pillar in, uh, in GitHub that you might have already seen. Um, so a lot of you have seen in open source projects where Dependabot comes along and helps you actually to bump your dependencies to new versions. And so part of that is also not only to keep um, to keep up with dependency updates, but also to really help the community to get dependencies updated that are that have known security vulnerabilities. Um, reminder: Log for J in the recent past. Uh, I think JUnit was affected as well at some point. So, independent about actually helps you to to get those things fixed up. And the, the fourth pillar that we're going to talk about today, and which we're we going to do a deep dive into, is the code scanning uh, part. And so code scanning is, is, um, is kind of a, a piece of different, of different things. So let's switch over to GitHub and let's have a quick look at that. 
Uh, so here I have like a, a repository of mine. Uh, this is a public repository. It's a small Java library uh, used to um, to do like scope system properties, like system properties that have a scope. Um, but it doesn't matter for now. What I want to show you is how to enable the security aspects in GitHub. So what you can do is you can go to settings and go to security and analysis. And here you have like the different things that we, we can do. And so for example, one large thing here is the code scanning uh, setup. So what code scanning does is it, it provides you a facility at GitHub to um, have some other thing scan your code and report it back as part of the GitHub experience. So if you click setup here, uh, it actually offers you different providers how to scan your code. Uh, one of the most prominent one is the CodeQL analysis, which is the one we're going to talk, to, um, uh, talk about today. There are also a lot of other um, providers in the marketplace that help you to set up um, different things. So if you're using any of those tools already, you can actually just plug it into, into your GitHub um, workflow. But today, um, what we're going to do is set up CodeQL. And in order to do that, you, uh, it provides you actually with a, with a template to uh, set up a GitHub action right in your repository, sets up all the, all the defaults for you already. And once you, once you start that, you can actually, um, it actually does analyze your code and reports back to security vulnerabilities. And in order to short secret that, um, I've prepared a demo here, which is also like available publicly. Uh, you can you can watch that. So this is a demo project prepared to have vulnerability in in place. And so what happens once you have that GitHub action set up and it analyzed your library or your your project, um, you have your security tab. So this is this is not visible to everyone. It's only visible to maintainers in GitHub. Um, you can see all the different things here and including the code scanning alerts. And you see that here on the bottom, it did actually find an alert. Uh, so if we look at that, we can see, oh, okay. Um, we actually do execute something and we use some, some variable here and that actually comes from request. And so we detected, okay, like a malicious user could could actually send requests to our, our application and we will actually happily execute that on, on a shell. So that's that's not good. Uh, and so we have a command line injection problem here. And so th this is the user facing part of code scanning, uh, which is it uses, for example, in this case, it uses CodeQL to analyze the code base and raise those alerts. And today we're gonna look a little bit behind the scenes. How does CodeQL do this? Uh, how does it detect those things? Because uh, these rules or these queries, those are all written um, by the community in, in an open source fashion. And let's today we're going to learn how to do that and what CodeQL, like what, what's so special about CodeQL. And in order to explain it on a bigger example, um, we use the story of Alvaro. Uh, he recently, I think it's two months ago, three months ago, uh, he found a command line injection uh, problem in Apache Double, which was quite interesting to, to watch uh, unfold because he actually documented the whole story of how he used different tools. Like, so Alvaro is uh, part of the security lab at GitHub and how he used like the different tools uh, like QL to actually find those, um, those attack vectors. And he was nice enough to write up a blog post about this whole thing. Uh, it's I can highly recommend reading that. It's an interesting story of uh, a lot of architectural decisions and how everything ties together uh, that makes makes the whole thing vulnerable. Uh, and as you might imagine, like most problems or most attack vectors are not that simple. Uh, so I tried to screenshot the blog post for you. Uh, the problem is, is actually it, it is so long. I had to take multiple screenshots um, and stitch them together because he went into full detail of how how the whole story unfolded and how he found the different things. And uh, it was really, really awesome to read how he used those, those tools that we provide uh, in order to find, to find those problems. And so with that being said, let's start learning about QQL and uh, how to write those queries. So to 
make some distinctions here between what we write, what's uh, been offered by GitHub and um, how the open source community ties into that. I want to explain a few concepts of CodeQL. Um, the whole idea of CodeQL is that you can query your code as if it were data. So in order to do that, uh, what CodeQL does is it looks at your code base and it extracts all the information from the code base into a specialized database. So it abstract, or like it, it reads your source code. Um, it, with the help of the compiler, it, it reads all the type definitions. It, it extracts all the different um, inheritance hierarchies. It, it pulls out uh, control flow graphs, like this statement happens after this statement. Um, it pulls in, it, or it, it extracts and interpolates uh, things like semantics. Like if you have an if statement, and you reach, like you go into the if statement, you know that the condition is true of the if statement because you, you, you went there. And so with, with, a lot of, with a lot of that information, it in the end lets you write queries that can query the specialized database um, to figure out uh, things like uh, finding certain attack vectors or also doing general analysis of a code base. For example, if you do an architectural review uh, it helps you to find certain patterns in a code base and how they tie together. So let's start with our first basic query and see how that goes. Um, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had one question. I'm guessing you're going to get to this. Sure. I'll, I'll mention it just in case. Uh, Brad says, how much actual configuration is there to have CodeQL work with your project? Will that configuration need to be updated as you add more parts um, and modules to your project? That's actually a great question. Um, let's go here. So uh, thanks for the question. I think that that's an important piece to know. So CodeQL, what it does is it tries to offload a lot of the complicated work uh, of analyzing source code onto the compilers that it use. So it, it a little bit depends on which language you are analyzing. Uh, so for example, some languages like Java, um, you usually have a build tool around like Gradle or Maven, and it actually, it, it interacts with those build tools to build the source code. So it, you don't have to replicate your project structure or anything with CodeQL. It just attaches itself to the compiler and like extracts that all of that as part of your, of your regular build. Uh, so you don't have to have any specialized setup for that. For other code bases um, like Python or, or TypeScript or JavaScript, um, it, it actually can just run without a build. So it just analyzes your code. Uh, so there's usually no no extra setup needed for CodeQL. Uh, it just piggybacks on on your existing tooling and on your existing um, build tools. I hope that answers the question. All right, let's go with the, the query basics. And thanks for raising uh, the question, Keto. That was great. So first demo is uh, we have a. Very simple class here, a Java class. Uh, we have a greet method, a say hello world uh, method, a say method. Uh, so not, not too complicated right now. And let's start with querying that, uh, that simple class. So one of the most basic queries uh, that we can write in, in CodeQL looks like this. So we have a from and a select. And in order to, to understand CodeQL is you, you think of it as um, so most of the times you're operating on AST nodes or on, on abstractions of AST nodes. So for example, in this, in this case, in this query, uh, we want to look at all methods. So we say from method M, that means all methods that are out there that CodeQL knows about in your code and any code of the dependencies, all the methods. And you want to select that method without any restriction. Um, in, in the live demo later on, we will play around a little bit with that. So if, if we do that, um, in this case, we actually do find those four method definitions. So method in this case is actually a method definition. Uh, so this in this example, we are using Java. Uh, you can use the same thing in other languages. They might have uh, different syntactical abstractions. So it might uh, might a little be a little bit different depending on the language you're working with, uh, but the, the core concepts in the query language stay the same. Let's go for the next example, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, first line is actually it's something I omitted in the first example. It's import Java, which means we import anything that CodeQL knows about the Java ecosystem. 
uh, in order to like know about the the special the spe specialties of of Java. And again, we select all methods like from method. Uh, we look at all the methods. We only select those like using a where clause where the number of parameters is greater than zero, uh, which ends up selecting this one method on the right. Uh, it's the same method. It has more than one. Uh, it has more than zero parameters. So far, no, no real um, interesting things. Going going further, um, let's look at not only the method definitions but also at who is calling a method. Because when you, for example, want to understand the code base, you not only want to understand like the the syntactic. Uh, aspect of the code base. You also want to know who is calling what, like which methods are calling this other method, which methods, for example, are calling database methods, which methods um, or which which things make sure you call out to an external service. So those are all things you want to model. And so in this in this example, we again import Java and we look at all method access uh, objects. And so in method access in this case is any call site to a method, not a method definition, but actually a call to a method. And if we want to expand that a little bit, let's say, let's look at all the possible method access um, where the number of arguments is greater than zero, which selects these two. And actually we don't select the method access itself, like not the whole expression. We only want to select the argument that's passed in because we want to, for example, analyze it. And in this case, you already see, um, for example, you have a static string or you have a variable. At this point, you don't know the, uh, the value of the variable, but those are things that um, later on in adv more advanced um, CodeQL concepts, we will understand how we, how we use those. All right. Oh, actually, there, there's one more. See, that's why I love CodeQL, because it, it actually, like, it, it doesn't care how we read the code. It will actually find all the places. So let's go and do a demo here. So what we have here is actually our initial example. Uh, we select all methods. And we have a restriction here, which is called from source. Let's actually, let's remove that. And so when, when I press a key binding here, um, the only thing I'm doing is CodeQL run query. So I'm here, here in VS Code, uh, which is the preferred editor for um, CodeQL query editing because it has like a full-blown CodeQL extension. Um, so over here, we have an extension, we have editors and everything ready. Uh, we have the database for our different projects that we're going to analyze today. And it's that that's that's one part how you how you can do that. Uh, so this is mostly for developing queries for actually running them in the end. Uh, you would, for example, push them to GitHub let your GitHub action analyze your, your code base using those queries. But for developing, uh, VS Code is, is the best um, approach. And so right now, what we did is we have a simple query set up. We did run the query against our sample project. And we get a lot of um, methods here. And we actually see we have 400 pages of how many are there, 20? So it's actually 9,000 methods which is a lot because my, my code base actually only has one class. Uh, so in the problem is we did select all the methods that CodeGuard knows about in this context. And when analyzing this project, it analyzed the project and all its dependencies, for example, DJDK as well. So we want to restrict it to, um, to only methods that are in our, in our own code base for now. Uh, for for more, like, more complicated analysis, you actually want to look at the whole thing uh, for, for our use case right now. We just want to look at our source code that we that we wrote. And we see two methods here. Uh, if we click on it, it actually opens it up. So I have like a very, very small code base here. It has a greet method, has a translate method. We will go into detail more uh, as we progress. And so th this is essentially how you, how you create that code base. If we want to, do, for example, do something, um, Different, for example, we want to find all the if statements. Uh, let's do that. So from all if statements that are that um, CodeQL knows about, let's select all the if statements that have an enclosed and callable. So they're like part of a method. 
like all statements, all if statements are part of a method, but those methods should be also from source again. So we don't want to select all the ifs in the JDK. And let's run this again. And we see we have found one if statement. And if we click at that, it's actually the if statement in our method here. And we can now go further and analyze the expressions in here or whether when they're like evaluated or not. Let's let's uh, make slow progress. So this is how you do like basic queries in CodeQL. And so far, this hasn't like we haven't talked about how is this like an alert or a problem in the code base. Right now, we are just analyzing a code base. We haven't like we, we are not at the point yet that we say there is a problem. This would be a good time for questions if you have any. Peter. Uh, right. We don't actually have any new questions right okay. now. So cool. I, I think uh, Matt had a question about uh, one statement, but I think you answered it along the way. So I think we're good. Okay, sweet. So we have now talked about analyzing individual things in the code base and just looking at like lists of things. And now let's get, let's dive into a little bit more um, interesting topics. So one of the most interesting topics when you analyze a code base is data flow, like how data flows from one place to the other, um, how one JNDI string flows into a log statement. Those are the, the things we're looking at when we talk about data flow. And um, I actually want to use, I, I, I'm not going to use the log4j example. I'm, I still prefer Bobby tables. Uh, so let's stick with that. Um, on the left side, we have a source of data. For example, uh, as part of a query string, someone outside of our, of our system can actually provide a user input, whether that's a query string or a form input or whatever kind of application you do, there's always a source of user input. And this is what we call like a source. And at the same time, we also have like parts of the system where this data goes to. Uh, and in CookQL land, we call those sinks. So um, you have like a lot of different sources where data can flow into the system and you have a lot of, of sinks, for example, um, uh, database methods or external calls or uh, handling file system access. Those are sinks where it's really important that certain kind of data is properly validated and only used in, uh, in certain forms. So. When we talk about data flow, we talk about how can data go from a source to a sink? What immediate steps does it do? Um, and what are the problems that arise when we try to analyze those kind of things? And we take our example from before. Uh, on the right side, we have this Java class, which just has a greet method, and it takes a string and a, and a Boolean. Depending on the value of the Boolean, we either return the string that we get passed into, or we can we actually return like a, a transformed version of the string. On the left side, we have our we have a start of a CodeQL query. So we added a bunch of imports. You don't have to remember those. Uh, the tooling will help you to figure those out. On the bottom, we have um, we select the configuration that we will introduce in, in a second, and we select path nodes, which are nodes in, in your in your code that can be anything. It can be a parameter, it can be a method call, it can be anything. And we actually introduce two of them. And we say from all possible points in the system to all other possible points in the system, we only want to select those where there is a flow path. And the flow path is uh, the name for the data flow uh, in CodeQL. So we want to see all points in the system where data flows from A to B. We want to analyze how it flows. And then we look a little bit further in um, which of those are maybe interesting for us. In order to do so, um, it's first key to, to restrict that query. Um, as we've seen before, we don't want to analyze like the whole JVM ecosystem. We just analyze our code right now. And, for the purpose of this example, we actually restrict it to one single method, um, just to, so you, we, we have predictable results of what, what's, what we're looking at. And in order to do that, we can do, uh, we can actually introduce a glass or a predicate in, in CodeQL saying, 
a callable, which is either a constructor or a method. From all the callables in our system, select only the ones that have a name called greet. And in our system, that's the method on the right. So let's restrict it to that for now. The next part is how we configure data flow and what are the parts that we are interested in. So in, in our example here, what we're interested in is we are looking at all sources and we only select sources that are parameters. So we know we say no, it is an instance of data flow parameter node. And at the same time, it should be a parameter of our greet method. So we say the enclosing callable, the enclosing method of that parameter node should be our greet method. And to be honest, like this, this might be a little bit over the top for such a simple example, but just trying to show you different, different aspects of how you can uh, use CodeQL and how you can structure those queries. So now we've restricted our sources. Let's, right now, it, CodeQL would go off and say, I will look at all the possible outcomes of that, um, but let's, let's restrict that as well. So these are our sources. We selected all the parameters of our read method. The next part is we want to look at all our sinks. And our sinks, uh, we say that we look at all possible return statements in the system, really all return statements, but only the ones that are inside our read method. So again, we're using get enclosing, get enclosing callable and say this must be our read method. And those two together, the definition for sources and for sinks leads us to a path from here to here. So we know that when greet is called with the string bar, it will be returned here. And this is how CodeQL analyzed our data flow. And like some of our viewers might recognize, Benny, that's one possible flow, but there's one missing because there's also a return statement that returns something and it's not tracked here. And that's true because right now we talk about pure data flow. We know that this data flows to here. We don't know what happens here. In order to figure that out, we have to go a step further. Um, again, sources to sinks. If we look at what happens in the other branch of the combined, we have this translate method. In the translate method, what it does is it takes a string, it wraps it in a singleton list, it uses the iterator of that singleton list to get the next element. It, from that thing, it gets the bytes and constructs a new string using those bytes. And so, you might you might say yes, that's still the same as before, but for a compiler and for studying analysis tools. This is a completely different thing because this has nothing to do with our initial string anymore. Uh, these were like lists and iterators and bytes, and it's not the same anymore. But luckily enough, um, CodeQL does have a concept for that, which is called taint tracking. So we don't only track the data that's like that's flowing in in the in the system. We also track when some tainted data comes into the system. What other objects does it taint on the way? And if you've seen it maybe on the left, um, we just exchanged data flow with taint tracking. And now it automatically CodeQL does the same thing. It tracks bars or source, and bars are like the first return statements are sync, but it also tracks using taint tracking that translate actually returns the whole string. Sorry, there we go. So it tracks it through all the wrapping and and um, like conversion to bytes and conversion to different types, it actually still tracks that this is the same data that's floating through the system. Even though it, it changed form, it can still be tainted and can still be problematic if you don't validate that. All right. And this is how it actually sees those, those two flows. So talking about those flows, which is, like we, we've we've used a very simple example. Uh, the, the nice thing is, if we remove our our method filter, we can actually apply that to the whole system, and we can apply it to like actually a lot of code to find where, for example, does a query map parameter come into the system, 
and where it's passed into um, a problematic uh, sync like a SQL query. Now, most of you say, yeah, but we're using frameworks. Um, there is no like hard coded path. They use, for example, a lot of reflection to, to handle those things, like be it with using dependency injection, using other um, repositories and things, there will always be some reflection uh, happening or some serialization, deserialization process that is not obvious to an, a tool to actually overcome to see that data is actually flowing there. And for that, um, that is something that the, the CodeQL team calls uh, additional taint steps. We actually take a look at like popular frameworks and help those like help the engine to to understand there are certain data flows that might not be obvious from a compiler point of view, but they are there, and we can actually model them and help the engine to to find those. And these are like this is all open source, so a lot of people also from the outside are contributing new models for those different frameworks. Um, just recently, we, we got a large contribution um, for another web framework that we didn't support yet. So this, this is something that, that, that's actively going on. And the other part is um, we have now found a data flow that is happening. But what happens is, or like it finds all the flows, but those are not all problems. We just identified that there is a flow. We haven't identified yet. Is that like a prob problematic flow for like, is it an attack vector for our application? And so this is where validation comes in. Like a query parameter itself is only problematic if it's not validated. If we properly validate it against our rules, um, it's totally fine to put that into a SQL statement. And so this is where barriers come in. Uh, so there are lots of um, already defined barriers where we know that certain things actually sanitize data and it's okay that after like after sanitizing the data, it can actually be passed into a sync. So this is what um, we call barriers. And this is also something that you can either implement yourself or you can um, rely on the framework to, to handle that for you. And let's go into demo right now. So let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, so this is this is again the the example we we had in our slides. Uh, we have a predicate, only well, select our read method. We have a configuration, which in this case is a chain tracking configuration. It defines its sources. There only be parameters and should be a part of our read method. It looks at all the things. Uh, and our, all the things should be return statements that are part of our read method. And if we actually run that, you will see, let's start with a simple one. So you see that this is our parameter that flows into the return statement. This is our first, like this is like the real data flow. And then here is our taint flow, uh, which actually tracks like the parameter goes into this parameter or this argument of that method uh, will be will be wrapped in this list and will be pulled out using the iterator next, will be converted to bytes and will be converted back to strings. And that's how actually this, the, the value still taints the result of this method. So it might not be the same value given we prepended with foo but it's still like it's still tainted data and might still cause havoc in our system. And as I said, like this is the way how you develop queries. And if you go back to our GitHub code scanning UI, this is how those things are exposed. Um, so if you have a query like that in, in like set up for code scanning, it will actually show you the different steps, how the data flows through the system here in this UI uh, for you to like follow along and, and understand how the, how the data flows through the system. And so if you want, right now would be a good time for questions. Um, we have maybe one more live demo. Um, but yeah, we, we are good in time. 
All right. Well, I, I don't see any more questions in the chat. If you do have a question, uh, please let us know in the chat. Um, hopefully, Mark, you can hear me better now. I moved my mic. Um, and I, I had a couple questions myself, Benny. Um, sure. First of all, um, I see there's really wonderful VS Code integration. Um, is there integration for any other IDEs? Or um, not, not right now. Um, so there, there used to be IntelliJ and Eclipse integration, but um, all the efforts were made into a VS Code extension. Uh, not only because you can use it in VS Code, uh, which is the preferred editor uh, here at GitHub, uh, it's also because you can use it on the web, like using code spaces and, and other means. Um, so that's why we focus right now on VS Code integration. Okay. Uh, and I guess the other question is, how do you run it locally? I didn't see how you ran the engine, because you have to run the engine to create the database, right? Yes. Yeah. So is it just a command line tool or what? Yeah, you, you would actually just go, um, let's see. Let's make one on the other screen. All right. So I don't know if you if you have like you can use the code QL CLI and you would actually go great create database on your project. Oh. And so what, what this does is it looks at your it looks at your project and it tries to figure out okay what's what's the usual way to build this thing. Like if it's Maven that tries to uh, run Maven using the regular commands. You can also go and like um, do it yourselves. Uh, but usually you can try it just without the command. Um, we are in the meantime pretty good at like identifying like Maven and Gradle projects that know how to how to properly build them um, to extract all the information we need. Like you don't need to write run tests or anything. Um, so we strip it down to the bare minimum that we just compile the code and extract all the information from that. Um, what comes out of that is a database archive, and that's what you can use in VS Code to analyze the whole thing. Okay. So you can even like create a database in, as part of your CI and just create it locally if you don't want to build it locally. Nice. Yeah, that was another question. Um, is it possible to build a DB dump locally, which we just went over, for yep. an analysis only? Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. That's the same question I asked. Okay, so we're good with that one. Um, I had one more. Um, the way the first thing I've I've actually seen this before for security scans, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually play with code QL directly. Um, but what what I when I look at this, I see it as a great tool for um, forensic analysis. Like if you're um, essentially if you've inherited a legacy code base, um, yep. which I've everyone most people have done at some point in their careers. Um, yeah. Basically going through and and, and and analyzing it, figuring out what's going on. Do you see a lot of people using it for that? Um, it, it's interesting to bring uh, because you bring that up. Um, so the, the thing is, uh, CodeQL was actually created with multiple um, ideas in mind how to use that. So um, security analysis is one part where it like really really shines. CodeQL itself has. Um, let's actually go to um, go to no sorry. Um, let's actually go to the open source repository. And if you click through the Java queries, so now I need to take the right turn. So actually, if you look at all the queries that are out there, there's like a lot of things, like be it that code queries, architecture queries, uh, performance queries, likely box nice. queries. There are a lot of, so CodeQL was for like, it was developed uh, by a company called SAML, which got acquired by GitHub a few years ago. And before the acquisition, like there was a, a, a huge range of use cases that CodeQL supports. Uh, the thing is, we we realized that the impact on the ecosystem is the biggest. Using at least right now, using um, CodeQL as a tool for security analysis, given that right now there's still a lack of good tools to to do this kind of analysis. So that's why we focus our efforts onto uh, onto that. But CodeQL, as you said, like. It's a query language. The kind of queries you write, it completely depends on your use cases. And um, I, for example, I personally, I'm someone, I love using CodeQL to analyze a code base, to understand the code base, to like see the patterns and figure out the patterns. Um, so you can totally use it for that. It's not restricted to the security use, use case. And that's what I try to, to also um, bring across as part of those talks. Um, it's not only about security, you can do whatever query you want with CodeQL to analyze and understand your code base. Okay, cool. 
All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have right now. So thank you. Okay. Thanks. So uh, we have learned about data flow and we have learned about taint tracking and we learned about sinks and sources. Uh, and to, to wrap this up, we started initially with Alvaro's um, investigation into the Apache double uh, library. So what we saw there is um, there are certain sources that are really interesting where like stuff gets deserialized. And we've also like he found that uh, there were a couple of input streams or a couple of object input streams that are not validating the kind of data that flows into the system. And using those paths, like he tried to figure out which paths are possible that have no validation whatsoever. And this is how like using a query. Uh, so this is the query result from VS Code. Uh, using a query, he was actually able to um, find several CVEs in Apache Double. And I'm not blaming Apache Double. Like, um, this is a great project. Um, don't want to blame the project. I'm just using it as an example. Um, it was actually great to see, like, building CodeQL queries to really easily find those CVEs and, like, building queries that are not tied to one specific um, flow of data, but kind of learns that you can abstract away the kind of patterns you want to find, and it actually finds those. And it was, uh, there, there was another uh, interesting example in the Linux uh, kernel, I think a month or two ago, where someone found a very, um, very easy to, to miss uh, problem using, I think it was integer ranges or something. So it, it, like it, they found a bug and they patched it. And then, then they decided, let's run a CodeQL query on the Linux kernel and see if we have more of those use, like more of those problems. And they actually found another 10 of the exact same problem uh, in different places of the kernel. And using CodeQL is actually pretty easy if, you can write the query and you can run it on the whole code base and even on different code bases. And so what, what I mentioned before, um, so we do have like on the CodeQL open source project, we have a lot of security queries. And for example, these are the ones that are running uh, every night or how often you set it up on, for example, your, your projects to find any vulnerabilities in your, in your code. And so these are all open source. These are like work together by us and the community in order to, to make the ecosystem a little bit more secure. And to wrap this up, um, I want to point out a few resources that I find very interesting. Uh, so first off, we have the GitHub Security Lab uh, where uh, Avaro and others are working and finding new vulnerabilities using those tools. Um, they also have like bug bounty programs. Um, for example, you can actually contribute new CoQL queries and earn bug bounty money um, if you find CVEs using new queries. Uh, so that's certainly a thing that people are doing these days. Uh, you have the CoQL homepage, coql.github.com, where you find everything about CoQL, how to write queries, which queries exist, how to set up the whole like code scanning uh, flow for your repositories, how to contribute queries to CodeQL, how to set up custom queries in your project using code scanning. So there are lots of things out there. Um, today, I just did like a, a small brush on how you can use CodeQL to write your queries. Um, there's a, like a two and a half hour workshop uh, available if you're interested. Um, so this is the one I, I linked here is actually specific to Java. If you're interested in other languages, the same workshop exists for our different languages. So depending on what you want to analyze mostly, I, I can just refer you to the right um, workshop. And with that, let's secure the world software together. I'm looking forward to that and hope that you found maybe something in CodeQL that you can apply to your project, maybe something in code scanning. I would love to hear your thoughts. And you can always reach me on Twitter, or you can ask it here. Uh, that's it from my side. So we are open for questions or feedback or anything. Thanks. Hey Benny, that was awesome. Uh, I, uh, I I I now want to go run code queries on some of my uh, projects, especially some. Actually, the the talk I'm doing later is about a legacy code base. I kind of want to run it on that code base myself. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, looking to see is do you have any more questions? If you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. Thanks a lot. Great talk. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you so much.
Well, looks like we don't have any more questions. Uh, okay, so I, I guess that's it then. Um, stick around. Uh, there's, of course, many more sessions at uh, J Champions Con. At least a few more today. Um, and uh, thanks a lot, Benny. All right. Thank you. See you later.